Our scripture reading today is from Joshua, book 7, verses 6 to 13. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carrying trumpets in front. Am I? I'm sorry, I'm reading out of chapter 6. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. I'm sorry. Great. And it was opened up to the right. <laughs> I apologize very much. Then, jo- then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, O sovereign God, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your, great, your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things They have stolen, they have lied, they have put them in their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people, tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For that is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. That, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted is among you. O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until, I re- until you remove it. May God add his blessing and help with our understanding of his word. I, I, I love this passage here, and I'm going to read it again. And Joshua said, Oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. You know, you very well may have said similar words at some point in your life, especially when you've experienced defeat. I know I have. Sometimes I've questioned God when when suddenly something goes wrong in my life and and I try to blame God. God, why did you let this happen? Why? Why? And so it's so easy in those moments of trial and difficulty and challenge to give up. To say, let's go back over the Jordan. This was too hard. I don't know what God was thinking. And yet we read here in James chapter 1 verse 12, it says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love him. In other words, in the midst of challenge, difficulty, and trial, when you don't understand what's going on, keep going. Keep trying. And if you are faithful, you will receive a blessing. When I was a kid, we learned, uh, try, try again. And, uh, and so today, as we look at this lesson, I want you to think about that. Since it's Super Bowl Sunday, I want to tell you about my Grandma Hayes. My Grandma Hayes, she was a huge Denver Broncos fan. She lived just outside of Denver in Longmont, Colorado, and she rooted for the Broncos every year. As my Steelers were winning big in the 70s, Uh, We would often talk about it because her Broncos only tasted the bittersweet feeling of the runner-up in those years. They lost to Dallas in 1978 in the Super Bowl, and then came three blowout losses later in the 1980s. In 1987 and 1988, they made it to the Super Bowl, but they lost 39-20 to the Giants. 
and then 42 to 10 to Washington. Two years later, they got back to the big game only to lose to the 49ers by the embarrassing score of 55 to 10. It was one of the greatest losses in Super Bowl history. Their futility in the big games had only been matched by, uh, in later years, the Buffalo Bills, who went to the Super Bowl for four straight years and lost every one of them. Then, though, for the Denver Broncos, redemption came. In 1998 and 1999, everything changed. On their fifth and sixth tries, they came away with the championship. My grandmother was ecstatic, and she called me up to tell me about it bragging about her Broncos. They had finally managed to put it all together and were able to get rid of the label as losers. You know, their story is a little different from that of the Israelites under Joshua's leadership. In their first big battle, Joshua and the Israelites came away looking like champions. They must have felt like they won the Super Bowl and found their victory in Jericho. They came up against the most fortified city in all of Canaan and rolled over it like it was nothing. The people were on a spiritual high. God had led them to a great victory, and it seemed like nothing could stand in their way as they were moving into the promised land. It's like the feeling you get after being baptized. There's nothing like it. When you come up out of the water, the Holy Spirit grabs you and lifts your arms and says, well done, welcome to the family. The problem is that walking the Christian walk is not a one-and-done occasion. Following God is not something you do once and then walk away. You have to keep doing it. As Jesus said, you have to pick up your cross every day as you continue to follow Him. And it seems like the Israelites didn't really seem to get that. After that big victory, they stumbled. One man in particular, Achan, decided to keep some of the bounty that they had collected in their victory over Jericho. His decision went directly against God's command that everything should go into God's storehouse. They were to take nothing for themselves. Everything was to go to God. And his sin had disastrous consequences for the people. The next city in their path was one called Ai. It was nothing compared to Jericho. It was a tiny village with few resources, So Joshua, instead of going back to God and and considering his next step, and instead of looking at his people and seeing if their hearts were ready and prepared as he had done before Jericho, he sends off a couple thousand people and says, go ahead and take care of them. Overconfident, relying upon their own resources instead of touching base with God. Instead of the victory, the Israelites were humiliated. They were soundly defeated. And we read that Joshua became so despondent that he began to complain in this passage that Brian read. Why did you bring us here only to be slaughtered, God? I wonder wonder if that's how Jim Kelly, the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills, felt after their fourth consecutive humiliating loss in the Super Bowl. They were a great team. They had made it all the way to the championship, but they were flawed in ways That can't be measured. You see, that's what God said to Joshua when they went up against Ai. Someone sinned. Clean up your house and get back to work. The truth is that sin often gets in the way of victory. We stumble and fall. We end up doing things out of selfishness and pride. We may have tasted victory along the way, but maybe it went to our heads. Maybe that's what happened with Joshua. He wasn't as careful anymore, and he just thought that victory was going to come easily and without God's help, that he was a strong warrior, and he had warriors behind him, and they could do it themselves. When you start doing that, everything starts falling apart. We see that all the time in the lives of celebrities, sports figures, politicians, They get cocky, overconfident, and start playing fast and furious with the rules, and often then will get themselves in trouble. A number of years ago, there was a U.S. senator who was the chair of the committee overseeing the banking regulations. When his wife wanted a mortgage, she's offered a sweetheart deal, and she took it. 
but it was against the rules. And when he was confronted with it, he claimed that he didn't know about it. He was the Achan of his day, or maybe you could say he was the Joshua of his day, that he didn't even know what was happening within his ranks. I don't care who you are. The only way to taste victory in life is to follow God's plan. Even Joshua forgot that. Before going up against Jericho, he had spent time in prayer, seeking God's direction, and God gave him specific instructions on what he needed to do to win the battle. But after that victory, he got careless. He stopped relying on God, and that's how he missed Achan's sin. And that led to their terrible defeat. It's a great reminder that we need to be walking with God if we want to taste victory and celebrate it in our lives. We often get too self-confident and think we can do it on our own. And when that happens, it won't be long after that we realize that we can't do anything without God's help. The Lord's Prayer says this, Give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say monthly, weekly, or yearly. Our walk with Jesus is a daily, day-by-day walk. That means every day we must spend time with Him. Every day has its new battles. Every day there are new troubles coming at us. Every day a new temptation comes our way. On Sunday nights, we're looking at C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. And in that, in that wonderfully created, crafted book, we see all the subtle ways that the enemy tempts us and tries to throw us off. Unless we get a daily infusion of the power of the Holy Spirit, we could end up in the same position as Israel after its battle with Ai. What I like about this story is the fact that it reminds us that every loss is not final, though. We may lose a battle every now and then, but we need to keep trying. Joshua committed. They followed God's direction. They took care of Achan. And then they bent back to their knees and went to God. So if we stumble, we need to get on our knees and we need to go to God. We need to open our Bibles and seek God's wisdom and direction, and then we need to try again. Author Nick Wojcik was born without arms or legs due to a rare congenital disorder called Tetra Amelia Syndrome. I saw him at a conference several years ago, and it was really funny because as he was on stage with the, uh, with the uh, host, um, he said to someone, I need a drink of water. And so some stagehand came out with a bottle of water, went to hand it to him. And all of a sudden, everybody realized he had no hands. He couldn't hold it. And so they had to give him the water himself. And he went on to say, he said, you know, that's, that's typical of things that have happened in his life. And as part of the frustrations that he's had to learn to deal with, he, par his parents were very supportive of him as a child, but he still questioned why him. Over the years, his faith kept him going. And he believed that God had a purpose for his life. He didn't know what it was. He couldn't see all the pieces of the puzzle. All he knew was that it was a challenging puzzle to try to understand how God could use him. But it seems like in his testimony, he says that God always put people in his life, people like you, who came along at just the right moment with a word of encouragement or some word that God put on your heart to share with him. And I want to encourage you, if God puts a word in your heart to share with someone, share it. You might say, you know, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know why, but, but I just want to tell Hannah Gibson it's so nice to see her today. Hannah has been working for, for, for a number of years now, and Sundays are on her schedule and she can't get here. Hannah, it is so nice to see Don't turn red. Hannah, it's so <laughs> nice to see you today and have you sing it. But if God puts a word on your heart, say it. Share it, because you don't know if that's just the word that they need. And Nick Wojcik said it, it was strange because he was at school once in his freshman year, and the janitor of the school came up to him and said, Nick I know God has put it on you to be a great speaker someday. And Nick said, yeah, right. Who's going to listen to me? I can't do anything for myself. I can't help anyone else. But Nick says that the next year, he spoke to a crowd of 30 in his class and shared his story, and there wasn't a dry eye 
as he shared about the victories, the little victories he had. He said at 19, he shared with a whole auditorium, 300 fellow students, and began to talk to them about overcoming the challenges of life. And you could believe me. You hearing from someone who has no arms and no legs, telling you that they have become a victor over some of the challenge of their life. You look at yourself and you say, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. He has talked to millions of people worldwide now, giving us hope and victory. And what that janitor saw in him became a reality because he remained in Christ and he knew that he couldn't do it on his own but that if he kept trying, God would make a way for him. The truth is that sometimes after our biggest victories, we will stumble and fall like Joshua and the Israelites. When we look back on them, we'll see that, that, that he hadn't prepared. And we know that sometimes when our failures come, it's because we haven't prayed we haven't sought God's direction. We haven't confronted the sin in our lives. And Joshua learned that these were the key to victory. And he never forgot. Every time after that, when he went to battle, he drank from the well of God's spirit. They say the key to the Denver Broncos quarterback, John Elway's success in the end, was he never gave up. He kept trying. He was known for his late game comebacks and he didn't let the scoreboard dictate his play. He knew who he was playing for and he played to win. And that's the kind of attitude that we need to have as we are serving God in the world. We need to know who we're playing for. We're playing for God. He's sending us out to claim the victory for him. Joshua had been given the promised land and all he had to do was to follow God's game plan. You know what I love about this year's Super Bowl? Both team leaders are outspoken Christians. Brock Purdy, who they call him Mr. Irrelevant because he was the last person chosen in the National Football League draft. Last one. It's kind of like when you're on the playground and they're picking teams. I was the last one chosen a few times. <laughs> You know you're not highly regarded, and yet in his two years in the National Football League, last year he led his team to the brink of the championship. And this year he's in the Super Bowl. And he says this uh, when asked, he was interviewed, and, and Brock Purdy said he'll be playing Sunday as his 49ers take on the Chiefs, but not for a win. Instead, as he always does during games, he'll be praying for peace. It's not, God, can we win here? Can we do something great here? It's more just to have that peace and steadfastness in all the chaos of Super Bowl week, he said while meeting in re the reporters. In interviews on social media and in conversation with teammates, Purdy puts the focus on his faith in God. There was a big controversy not too long ago because the television reporter cut out the part where he referenced God. It went from, yeah, I want to do a great thing for the city of San Francisco. And they ended up putting that back in. But he always put the focus on God. He says, being a professional athlete, it's easy to get wrapped up in your job, just like Joshua got wrapped up in the victory. But having a perspective on what your purpose in life is with your family, faith first, and God, I think these are for me number one, he said this week. Patrick Mahomes is the... the uh, quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, and a lot of attention is focused on, on our own Taylor Swift <laughs> and Travis Kelsey, her boyfriend, but Patrick Mahomes is the, the one that drives that team. He's an evangelical Christian, an athlete who's tasted many victories on and off the field, and he talked about his faith. He said, my Christian faith plays a role in everything that I do. I ask God to lead me in the right direction and let me be who I am for His name's sake. So it has a role in everything that I do. Obviously, we'll be on the huge stage in the Super Bowl that He's given me. And I want to make sure I'm glorifying Him while I do it. You see, that's the attitude that we need as we live out our Christian faith. It's not just about us. It's going to God. And when we fail and stumble, to look at ourselves and to go back to God and try and try again. Putting your faith in Christ doesn't mean you'll win every battle, but the odds are that you will come in a victor in the game of life. So don't let 
setbacks stop you from moving ahead. Get ready to try and try again. And then to let God have His way in your life. Let God be the one who leads you forth into wherever you're going. And then as you rely on His power, you will have victory that will bring glory to God and joy to your life. May it be so as you live out your calling as a follower of Jesus. Amen.